brought to you by Penguin. Tess of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy Read by Sean Clifford General Editor's Preface This edition uses, with one exception, the first edition in volume form of each of Hardy's novels and therefore offers something not generally available. Their dates range from 1871 to 1897. The purpose behind this choice is to present each novel as the creation of its own period and without revisions of later times, since these versions have an integrity and value of their own. The outline of textual history that follows is designed to expand on this statement. All of Hardy's 14 novels, except Jude the Obscure, 1895, which first appeared as a volume in the Wessex novels, were published individually as he wrote them, from 1871 onwards. Apart from Desperate Remedies, 1871, and Under the Greenwood Tree, 1872, all were published first as serials in periodicals, where they were subjected to varying degrees of editorial interference and censorship. Desperate Remedies and Under the Greenwood Tree appeared directly in volume form from Tinsley Brothers. By 1895, ten more novels had been published in volumes by six different publishers. By 1895, Hardy was sufficiently well established to negotiate with Osgood McIlvain, a collected edition of all earlier novels and short story collections, plus the volume edition of Jude the Obscure. The well-beloved, radically changed from its serialised version, was added in 1897, completing the appearance of all Hardy's novels in volume form. Significantly, this collection was called The Wessex Novels and contained a map of The Wessex of the Novels and authorial prefaces, as well as frontispieces by Macbeth Rabin of a scene from the novel sketched On the Spot. The texts were heavily revised by Hardy, amongst other things in relation to topography, to strengthen the Wessex element so as to suggest that this half-real, half-imagined location had been coherently conceived from the beginning, though of course he knew that this was not so. In practice, Wessex had an uncertain and ambiguous development in the earlier editions. To trace the growth of Wessex in the novels as they appeared, it is necessary to read them in their original pre-1895 form, for the 1895-6 edition represents a substantial layer of reworking. Similarly, in the last fully revised and collected edition of 1912-13, the Wessex edition, further alterations were made to topographical detail and photographs of Dorset were included. In the more open climate of opinion then prevailing, Sexual and religious references were sometimes, though not always, made bolder. In both collected editions, there are also many changes of other kinds. In addition, novels and short story volumes were grouped thematically as novels of character and environment, romances and fantasies, and novels of ingenuity, in a way suggesting a unifying master plan underlying all texts. A few revisions were made for the Melstock edition of 1919-20, but to only some texts. It is various versions of the 1912-13 edition which are generally available today, incorporating these layers of alteration and shaped in part by the critical climate when the alterations were made. Therefore, the present edition offers the texts as Hardy's readers first encountered them, in a form of which he in general approved, the version that his early critics reacted to. It reveals Hardy as he first dawned upon the public and shows how his writing, including the creation of Wessex, developed partly in response to differing climates of opinion in the 1870s, 1880s and early 1890s. Patricia Ingham, St Anne's College, Oxford Introduction by Margaret R. Higginett New readers are advised that this introduction makes the detail of the plot explicit. When Tess of the D'Urbervilles appeared in early December 1891, its scandalous notoriety among some readers and impassioned popularity among others made Hardy financially secure and confirmed his stature as one of the major writers of the 19th century. The passage of the United States Copyright Bill had guaranteed an income from the American serialisation in Harper's Bazaar and from the subsequent book publication without risk of piracy and Hardy's publishers scrambled to reprint the novel. Readers, reviewers and the author himself responded to the heroine as if she were a real person capable of change through time. To one correspondent who wrote in her praise, he answered, 
I am so truly glad that Tess the woman has won your affections. I, too, lost my heart to her as I went on with her history. The sharply divided reactions to the book focused on the heroine and on the claim made by Hardy's exasperating, and exasperated, subtitle, A Pure Woman, which he had added at the last minute to proofs of the three-volume first edition. In his autobiography, Hardy reported that the Duchess of Abercorn's dinner guests had been almost fighting across her dinner table over Tess's character. Those who thought the little harlot deserved hanging were put in one group, those who pitied her as a poor wronged innocent sat in another, together with the Duchess. Even before the novel was printed, the rejection of the manuscript on moral grounds by three publishers in a row guaranteed that it would be born into controversy. Accepted in censored form by The Graphic, a family magazine, Tess was dismembered, with three key episodes removed and published separately in two sketches. These changes necessitated further bowlerisation, and in one scene, the heroine's modesty was rescued at the last minute by the graphic editor, who insisted that she be transported in a wheelbarrow along a flooded lane rather than carried in Angel's arms. Having been forced earlier by publishers to adapt The Woodlanders and a group of noble dames, and frustrated by this piecemeal mode of parturition, Hardy reacted by turning Tess into a vehicle for attack on the censorship of prudery. Already in his 1890 article on candour in English fiction, he condemned popular magazines and lending libraries for excluding subjects, especially sexuality and childbirth, deemed incompatible with social forms and ordinances. In the serial version of Tess, which ran from July to December 1891, and yet more so in the subtly revised volume editions, Hardy deliberately and combatively obscured the question of Tess's purity. As can be seen in Tim Dolan's history of the text, through successive revisions, Hardy complicated motives and compounded contradictions in Tess's relation to her cousin, Alec Durberville. He complained repeatedly about the mangling of the plot to satisfy the young girl reader of The Graphic, which obliged him to substitute a mock marriage for the seduction pure and simple of the original manuscript. The serial version, nonetheless, described Tess not as a simple victim, but as a girl made pliable by her economic dependence on Alec. The textual evidence indicates that throughout his revisions, Hardy intended the tension between Alec's violation of Tess and her physical compliance to remain unresolved. Hardy inserted many traces pointing to Tess's involvement. She confesses she ought to have seen sooner the import of Alec's attentions. She has stayed on at his estate perhaps a month before deciding she would not become his creature any longer. In letters, Hardy named her mistake a fool, yet he maintained the paradoxical morality that Tess was essentially pure, purer than many a so-called unsullied virgin. Conservative readers were not convinced by his claim. Mowbray Morris, who had already rejected the manuscript for serial publication by Macmillan's magazine as having rather too much succulence, returned to the attack in the quarterly review. There he mocked Tess's behaviour as implausible and immoral, compared Hardy's descriptions of Tess to a slave dealer appraising his wares, an insight that coincides with more recent accusations of voyeurism, and concluded that he had told a coarse and disagreeable story in a coarse and disagreeable manner. Similarly, R. H. Hutton in The Spectator, although he declared Tess to be perhaps the most powerful of Hardy's novels, found the heroine's case weak in those moments of her life when she might be supposed to have had control. Her failure to tell Angel of her past her reluctance to persist in seeking aid from his parents and her surrender to Alec's importunities and offers of aid to her family at the end. Though pure in instinct, she was not faithful to her pure instinct, he concluded. To such readers, Tess was a text like the Vermilion Letters, painted by a Methodist enthusiast on blank walls around the countryside, too hot for comfort. Once Hardy had reintegrated into the book, the censored scene in which Alec carries Tess off into the wood of the chase and the sequence depicting the baptism and death of Tess's infant, the structural implications of the debate over Tess's purity became more apparent in the narrative. Paradoxically, by describing the dismemberment and reassembly of his manuscript in terms that suggested the violation of a body, Hardy's explanatory note conveyed the impression that the frankly sexual elements of his novel had been the victim of an atrocity, thus reinforcing the implication that Tess herself had been violently assaulted. When Hardy had restored the true sequence of things, 
Defenders of Tess's purity could experience the powerful chain of images to which Tess is linked as yet another victim. The restored scene in Chapter 11, where Tess sleeps amid the leaves of the woods, while the narrator reflects on her feminine tissue doomed to receive, the coarse pattern of Alex Lust, and the image in Chapter 58 of her sleeping body stretched out for sacrifice on the altar at Stonehenge, now clearly bracketed recognisable parallels. The horse, Prince, pierced at night on the road. The legend of the white heart first spared, then killed in the forest. The field animals cornered and killed at harvest. The wounded pheasants left to die in a wood. And the peasant girls to whom mailed knights of old had dealt the same wrong. The scenes selected for illustration in the serial, about half of which were printed in Harper's Bazaar and the US edition of the novel, had included three of these moments. They had already highlighted moments of Alex's aggression, such as their first encounter when he forces a strawberry into her mouth. The drug Alec pours down Tess's throat, making her sputter and gasp in the 1891 edition, also implies that he then rapes her in her sleep. The narrator meditates that the cottagers just awakening at that hour had not the least inkling that their sister was in the hands of the spoiler. Alec himself admits, I did wrong, and offers to pay to the uttermost farthing. Such imagery and language have provided the foundation for readers' defences of Tess's purity of intention and the perception that the woman's tragedy is due to the tyranny of man and of social circumstance. Tess has provoked and tantalised readers then and now, in part perhaps because she seems to exceed the boundaries of the language that describes her. In an often quoted comment, Hardy wrote on the 29th of October, 1891, I am glad you like Tess, though I have not been able to put on paper all that she is or was to me. From Tess as naive teenager subject to economic blackmail by her shiftless parents and by an unscrupulous rake, to the proud, angry child mother of a sickly infant, the reserved yet sensuous woman whose passion for a minister's son sweeps away her resolve not to marry, the abject, self-mutilating sufferer of her husband's prudish rejection, and finally the murderess, whose passions break through in a brief moment of fulfilment. The seven phases of Tess's life shape a figure who seems to defy any classification. Physically as well, she conjoins different phases of her childhood with bouncing womanliness. This heterogeneity was precisely the objection raised by Ellen Moores, who in a 1960s review misguidedly complained that Tess is a patchwork of cultural stereotypes. Earth goddess, modern woman, doomed bride of balladry, prostitute, Victorian daughter, unwed mother, murderess and princess in disguise, Hardy's Tess is surely the all-purpose heroine. The complexity of Tess and of the determining event in her brief life exemplify some of Hardy's most powerful strategies in the novel. Ambiguous definition and multi-layered characterization, the highlighting of interpreters as those who shape meaning and resistance to narrative conventions about the relationship between events and endings. Each of these strategies is centred on the representation of Tess herself, but each also proliferates into other aspects of the novel. In the winter of 1890, probably when he was thinking about the phases through which his heroine passed, Hardy reflected that he was more than ever convinced that persons are successively various persons, according as each special strand in their characters is brought uppermost by circumstances. No doubt Angel overvalues his own flawed vision when he harshly proclaims to Tess after her wedding night confession why he cannot forgive her. You were one person, now you are another. Yet in a larger sense that Tess explains in her eloquent letter pleading for his return to her from Brazil, what was the past to me as soon as I met you? It was a dead thing altogether. I became another woman, filled full of new life from you. Hardy's focus on this principle of growth informs his resistance to insular categories and many of his breaks with established plot conventions. The same drive toward ambiguity and complication visible in Hardy's treatment of Tess's violation announces itself even in minor issues of naming. From the first sentence, the narrator offers two names for Tess's birthplace, the Vale of Blakemore or Blackmore. In the same scene, the antiquarian Parson Tringham salutes Jack Derbyfield with an ironic second appellation, Sir John Derbyville. In turn, we learn that Alec's family has usurped the Derbyville name and crest to displace their original name of Stoke, 
which might be too well remembered in association with his father's profits in a dubious trade, and which may remind us of his glowing cigar, or of the steam-driven threshing machinery that forces Tess to work ceaselessly. A forger of his mother's signature and a self-conscious performer, Alec appears unannounced in a farmhand smock amid the burning couch grass of the marlet vegetable plots to work with a pitchfork next to Tess, to whom he leeringly names himself the Old Other One, Ever generous, even toward the man who represents the tragic mischief in her life, Tess replies, I never said you were Satan. Above all, Tess herself eludes naming, though she courageously assumes her own identity. The poor wounded name of the epigraph from Shakespeare. Hardy actually considered giving her his own name, in which case the novel would have been entitled Tess of the Hardys. Mocking, teasing or benighted, the men in her life insistently rebaptize her with names such as Cuz, My Pretty, like the names of two cows, Artemis or Maidy. She steadily replies, Call me Tess. Having become Mrs Angel Clare in name only and forced to rely on arduous field labour at a Starbaker farm, she sheds her husband's surname, reverting to simple Tess in order to protect his reputation. In the end, Angel whom his father considers misnamed, finds her only after a postman hits upon the link between Derbyfield and Derbyville, and only after he himself has become simply Angel. This difficulty of naming has for Hardy epistemological significance. In the period when he was drafting Tess, Hardy read Plato's Cratylus and noted somewhat optimistically, a very good way of looking at things would be to regard everything as having an actual or false name and an intrinsic or true name, to ascertain which all endeavour should be made. The fact is that nearly all things are falsely, or rather inadequately, named. It is not surprising, therefore, that he refers to the idealist philosopher Immanuel Kant when addressing the question raised by the faithfully presented on the title page. We don't always remember as we should that in getting at the truth we get only at the true nature of the impression that an object, etc., produces on us, the true thing in itself being still beyond our knowledge, as Kant shows. Appearances and impressions deceive. Nature is an arch dissembler. Nothing is as it appears. The inadequacy of labels and the uncertainty of intrinsic meaning provoke a proliferation of interpretations. If the blind Mrs Durbeville reads with assurance the bodies of her birds to discern their names, diet and state of health, other readings are far less secure. Of the stone pillar at cross in hand, the narrator notes coolly that it marks the site of a miracle or murder or both, then twice returns to the differing accounts given of its history and purport. Tess shivers with the petite moor at a shepherd's account of an execution there. Similarly, when the cock crows on Tess's wedding day straight in the face of Angel, it appears to different dairy folk to identify him as a cuckold, though the dairyman does not say so outright. To augur the suicidal despair of the milkmaids who loved him in vain, or more prosaically, to indicate a change of weather. Readers may find an augury that Angel will deny Tess repeatedly, as Peter does Christ. Equal uncertainty surrounds one of the most threatening omens to foreshadow the destiny of Hardy's heroine, the legend of the Durbeville coach. Tess's mother Joan introduces the motif in a wishful aphorism, "'Tis well to be kin to a coach, even if you don't ride in an." The legendary coach, in which an abduction and a murder were supposed to have taken place, parodically becomes the fashionable dog cart in which Alec forces his kisses on Tess. A few years later, with a shiver of fear, Tess seems to recognise the dilapidated conveyance in which the bridal couple go to church as an uncanny echo from her past. But Angel does not explain to her the legend – or whether seeing the coach signifies death or commission of a crime, or both. On the eve of the Derbyfield household's removal from Marlott, Alec appears as a pale rider in a white Macintosh at the very moment when Tess fancied it was a carriage and horses. Like the fourth horseman of the apocalypse, he announces the beginning of the end for Tess. When he retells the legend finally, however, the ultimate question, who killed whom, has been lost from memory. In the struggle he killed her, or she killed him, I forget which. Such mocking reversibility of responsibility in a murder challenges the assumption that moral judgments can be fixed absolutely and for all time. 
These open-ended readings of images and events underscore the central way that the body of Tess invites and defeats readings. Dressed by her mother to obscure her youth, Tess is misread by Alec, who also underestimates her pride and independence. Angel cons the characters of her face as if they had been hieroglyphics, hoping to detect that her no means yes. Her melancholy expression puzzles him, as one deciding on the true construction of a difficult passage, for he cannot grasp her as being separate from himself. After their mutual confession, Angel believes, erroneously, the narrator tells us, her heart was not indexed in the honest freshness of her face. Although Tess herself seems to read character intuitively, she attracts contradictory and deceptive readings, as Patricia Ingham has argued, not only from Angel and Alec, but also from the narrator, who refutes yet reimposes men's language as a measure of her identity. One of Hardy's master themes, then, is the questioning of stereotypes, classifications and conventions that dictate interpretations of human character. Several passages in the novel echo his 1883 attack on condescending social classifications in The Dorsetshire Labourer. For Tess, Hardy borrowed the discussion of the supposed real but highly conventional Hodge, a condescending nickname for typical rural work folk. The falsity of any stereotype of Hodge arises in part from the extension of educational opportunities, the transformation of working conditions by new technologies and the displacement of traditional artisans when old forms of tenancy lapse. As conditions shift, so do identities. Hodge, in fact, is above all in this novel the woman worker, Tess, who becomes the touchstone to Tess's schematic misreadings. Freshly arrived at the dairy, Angel must learn to read human nature and to differentiate the workers at Dairyman Crick's farm from the conventional farm folk of his imagination, personified by the pitiable dummy known as Hodge. Upon closer acquaintance with the men and women at Talbothay's dairy, Angel's conventional image becomes disintegrated into a number of varied fellow creatures. Angel's slow apprenticeship in discrimination starts with his attunement to a fluty note in Tess's voice when she explains how she separates her body from her thoughts as she contemplates the stars. Yet as he distinguishes her from the young women with whom she works, he projects onto the figure before him idealised types of women, such as Artemis, Demeter, or the virtuous woman of King Lemuel. Thus he remains the prisoner of gender and class assumptions. Proudly, to his accusation on their wedding night that she is only an unapprehending peasant woman, she responds, I am only a peasant by position, not by nature. The tragic distance between Angel and Tess, which springs from his unconscious adherence to the prejudices of his milieu, can close only when he is ready to accept her with all that she has done and been as an individual, and that moment arrives only when she has surrendered herself to death. For Hardy, the problem of constructing a portrait, a character or a novel merges with the themes of displacement and death, for to fashion an image risks fixing the complex, mutable richness of the individual. Among the many motifs that point us toward this fear of killing into art, the effigy as an art of the dead or absent, especially in criminal law, evokes the ambiguous status of a representation that marks identity. The effigies in the family vaults at Kingsbeer sub Greenhill represent the legacy of d'Urberville traits, which we gradually learn include pride, exploitation of the poor and weak, and impulsive, at times criminal, violence. When Tess finally reaches the Abbey Church at Kingsbeer, she discovers those effigies have been defaced by the action of time and civil war, just as the name has been worn away to Derbyfield. The effigies' power to represent their originals has been mutilated. Their implied reincarnation in Tess can only be partial. Dispersed throughout the phases of her life, the images of the past assume spurious, legendary, mocking forms, such as that of her so-called cousin, Alec. The complex issue of shaping Tess's identity, which the narrator needs to name yet unname, becomes paradigmatic for the creative paradox of description and characterization. To some extent, Hardy suggests, generalisation is necessary to all observation. The art of observation consists in this, the seeing of great things in little things, the whole in the part, even the infinitesimal part. From a distance, the narrator presents an anonymous yet distinctive woman binding sheaves at Marlott, 
who seduces casual attention because she never courts it before he announces, it is Tess Derbyfield, otherwise Derbyville, somewhat changed, the same but not the same. The theme of sameness in Difference is indeed the crux of the aesthetic problem and of Tess's life. Tess has become a stranger and an alien here, though it was no strange land. Workers may be subsumed into the general by their tasks when their labour is communal rather than individualised. An alien observer visiting Talbothays might recondense into a singular hodge the dairy folk as they stoop in a serried line to weed a field. Tellingly, women are subsumed more into the type than men are. A field man is a personality of field. A field woman is a portion of the field. She has somehow lost her own margin, imbibed the essence of her surrounding and assimilated herself with it. Often, these momentary narrative generalisations assume a remote angle of vision that makes Tess representative. Assuming the long view, the narrator suggests that Tess, having disguised herself by snipping her eyebrows and putting on her oldest clothing, has come to seem a figure which is part of the landscape, a fieldwoman pure and simple. This tendency to essentialise feminine traits was intensified in the first edition of the novel, which introduces phrasing such as feminine curiosity or feminine hope. Indeed, for some feminist critics, one of the more problematic features in the narrator's voice has been its reductive impetus to define Tess as the quintessence of her sex, more woman than the other milkmaids, a whole sex condensed into one typical form or a portion of one organism called sex. In this condensation, for example, Penny Boomler finds the ideological elision of woman, sex and nature that shapes the tragic pattern of Hardy's work. As Boomler also observes, however, there is a heightened consciousness of such stylization of womanhood that throws into question the ideological basis of the novel's polarities. As a result, the narrative tension between differentiation and generalisation has provoked theoretical speculation about the significance of contradictions in the narrative voice. Early readers objected to an inconsistency of register, particularly to vocabulary such as photosphere or vitalisation, held to be inconsistent with the character of Tess, understood as a focaliser or as the consciousness circumscribing the narrative. Some recent readers have argued that this inconsistency is, as it were, consistent with a more general focus in the novel on the instability of meaning. Is there more than a single narrative voice, one deeply engaged with Tess's own perceptions, empathetic and located strategically close to her, and another more detached, more critical and pessimistic, as Simon Gatterall maintains? Or is there a mosaic of voices, each of which adapts to the local needs of a passage? Michael Milgate has argued that Hardy's method is not to blend together the disparate constituents of the fiction, but to leave them, individual, identifiable, in permanent suspension. Peter Widowson holds that Hardy's focus on differentiation and misrepresentation exposes characterization itself as a humanist realist mystification. Casting Hardy as a modernist, he suggests that in Tess, Hardy deliberately juxtaposed multiple registers in cubist fashion, fracturing the plane of vision to defamiliarise or estrange the plot. He points to Hardy's 1890 observation. Art is a disproportioning, i.e. distorting, throwing out of proportion, of realities, to show more clearly the features that matter in those realities, which, if merely copied or reported inventorially, might possibly be observed, but would more probably be overlooked. Hence realism is not art. In this view... Inconsistency can be understood as a tool of the vraisemblable, as a way to foreground the features that matter in the representation of realities. Hardy's understanding of realism in representation is indeed remarkably modern. Responding to J.M.W. Turner's watercolours, exhibited in 1889 at the Royal Academy, Hardy pondered the strange mixtures of light and objects through which the artist approximated the effect of the real. Art, he reflected, is the secret of how to produce by a false thing the effect of a true. Narrative structure was to be a critical tool for achieving the desired effect. One of his letters about Tess explains that he had violated strict notions of unity precisely in order to achieve an effect of realism. In response to criticism of an apparently unnecessary detail, Hardy disagreed, saying, 
It would take too long to explain why such apparently irregular modes of narrating are often to be countenanced for reasons of vraisemblance. The truth is that in artistic matters, literary and other, you often best keep the rules by occasionally breaking them. Social scripts, Hardy felt, dictated literary scripts. Weak writers of rigidly good family and rigidly correct education, he argued, mostly treat social conventions and contrivances, the artificial forms of living, as if they were cardinal facts of life. In Hardy's view, these artificial forms, which he called the doll of English fiction, must be demolished. To do so, he turned to apparently irregular modes of narrating that disrupted genre conventions with their precepts of unity of plot and uniformity of tone. Throughout his career, Hardy played with the ironic splicing of literary modes, perhaps most obviously in his first published novel, Desperate Remedies, 1871, and in his most blatantly feminist novel, The Hand of Ethel Berta, 1876. The juxtaposition of romance and melodrama, of comedy and tragedy, creates an effect of discontinuity in form that forces us to reinterpret both character and plot as we have imagined them in anticipation. In the Talbothay's courting days of Angel and Tess, for example, Hardy immerses the couple in transformative mists that encourage their mutual idealisation, then disrupts the mood suddenly when they return to the house, where Dairyman Crick is expostulating to old Deborah Fyander for not washing her hands. The sharp narrative turn dissipates the romantic tone and shatters the illusions of any London folk among the readers who might be ignorant of the slovenly ways of some milkers. Similarly, he follows up a passionate moment in their idyll with a plebeian chapter in which the entire workforce goes out to clear a field because in the dairy's excellent milk, a twang of garlic has been discovered. The twang of the real briefly interrupts the transcendent movement of romance. It offers an unheeded warning to Angel and to Tess as well. Et in Arcadia ego. I too am in Arcadia, says Death. Hardy achieves a similar effect of interrogation by repeating an image of expansive joy in the very different circumstances of alcoholic release. As she crosses the threshold of the Var Valley to begin work in the dairy at Talbothays, Tess's reviving hopes mingle with the sunshine in an ideal photosphere, preparing us for the luminous gloom of affection that will temporarily envelop and protect her from the wolves of fear and shame that menace her engagement to Angel Clare. The couple's perception of a phosphorescent gleam that illuminates them both is not so very different, it would seem, from the sort of halo and occidental glow that comes over her mother, Joan Derbyfield, at the alehouse, enabling her to shut out pressing needs and to see in her defective husband an ideal lover. Drink has transformed the villagers sitting there so that their souls expanded beyond their skins, spreading their personalities warmly and gilding their surroundings. At the market town of Chaseborough too, after an evening of drink and dance, however terrestrial and lumpy to the uninebriated eye the workfolk might be, to themselves they seemed to soar, themselves and surrounding nature forming an organism of which all the parts harmoniously and joyously interpenetrated each other their shadow surrounded by a beatific halo. Violence, however, immediately follows the scenes of drunken release, and the transfiguration of Angel and Tess by love will have its own gothic sequel in the honeymoon at Wellbridge, when Angel, in his conscious hours, ruthlessly rejects his wife, and in his unconscious hours, mourns over her enshrouded body as if she were dead. It is no accident that this ecstatic rendition of pastoral love should be so shot through with notes of dark admonition or that the currents of Eros and Thanatos should converge under an irresistible law. To John Addington Simmons, Hardy wrote in 1889, All comedy is tragedy, if you only look deep enough into it. Despite Tess's clinging to principle, to her vow not to marry after her violation by Alec, she is carried forward by her desire for happiness, by Angel's insistent coaxing, and by the surroundings that impregnate them both. She attempts to tell him her experiences, in the face of his condescension, loving satire and interruptions, but she is swayed to accept the silence he presses on her by her appetite for joy, as the tide sways the helpless weed. As weeks pass, she delays a decision. In reality, she was drifting into acquiescence. Every wave of her blood, every pulse singing in her ears, was a voice that joined with nature in revolt against her scrupulousness. The drive toward joy, which Freud would call the pleasure principle, 
and the desire to preserve this moment of happiness, of perpetual betrothal, prevent her from speaking as she yields to the tides of life. Yet here too, in this flux and reflux, Hardy converts the language of ecstasy into a premonition of loss to come. The imagery of Tess's surrender turns subliminally against her happiness, threatening her with submersion as if she were Ophelia. Her feelings almost filled her ears like a babble of waves and surged up to her eyes. As the water rises, squirts through the weirs and booms in a multitudinous intonation, Tess fatalistically is carried along without the sense of a will. She accordingly drifted into that passive responsiveness to all things her lover suggested. Self-annihilation looms ahead, whether through the suppression of her most significant experience or through an honest declaration whose price will be her happiness. Hence the feelings that lift Tess also drown her. Her instinct for self-preservation impels her toward candour and toward self-destruction. Hardy elaborates a Keatsian duality in the courtship, in which the thread of her life was so distinctly twisted of two strands, positive pleasure and positive pain. Tess takes refuge from Angel's entreaties in a willow thicket where she lies moaning on a bed of spear grass, her palpitating misery broken by momentary shoots of joy. The seesawing mixture of pleasure and pain tears her and alienates her from those who cannot understand her dilemma. The mixture of misery and joy, dark and light, seems the inevitable extension of the uncultivated twilight garden in Chapter 19, strangely reminiscent of Hieronymus Bosch, with its dazzling but malodorous weeds, thistle milk and slug slime, the air filled with floating pollen, where the two are first brought together by the thin music of Angel's harp. If the imagery of a green world that suffuses the Talbothay's romance is idyllic, it is also anti-romantic. Where opposites touch, they become entangled or suspended momentarily in equilibrium, but not, as Coleridge would have it, reconciled. Tess's oscillation between joy and agony draws on bitter references to romantic poetry, especially to Wordsworth and Coleridge. From the outset, Wordsworth's lyrical ballad about nature's holy plan provokes a sharp rejoinder in light of the vulnerability of the weak to the Darwinian struggle for survival. Fecundity does not guarantee the survival of the individual, as the Malthusian Tess early comes to understand in contemplating her parents' improvidence. The pathos of Tess's younger siblings left without a father, a home, or any source of food and clothing, inspires the narrator to comment on the ghastly satire in Wordsworth's lines, not in utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come. More subliminal cues refer us as well to Coleridge's dejection and ode, whose narrative line here is turned inside out, with the imagery of joy the luminous cloud as a light, a glory, a fair luminous cloud, enveloping the earth preceding angels' desiccating intellectual reflections on his situation in a grief that is void, dark and drear. The brief moment of fulfilment that the couple enjoy when they take refuge from the police after the murder of Alec offers its own comment on the term pure in Coleridge's line, joy that ne'er was given, save to the pure and in their purest hour. Ironic juxtapositions and sharp shifts in tone quickly catch the eye of a reader, Participating in a Shakespearean tradition that sets high romance against the farce of clowns, such ruptures become naturalised as one aspect of tragic irony. More profoundly disturbing, but less patent on the surface, are romantic plots that are dismembered, inverted and dispersed across the narrative, like the legend of the D'Urberville coach. The novel is thick with such ironic allusions to Milton, medieval romance, romantic poetry, opera, country songs and folklore. Many details in the narrative awaken the ghostly trace of familiar fairy tales, mixing Christian with pagan, including verbal touches like the description of the twilight garden, whose sticky blights, though snow-white on the apple tree trunks, made blood-red stains on her skin. Characteristically, however, these motifs are both rearranged and turned into grotesque inversions of conventional plots. Some echoes may not have been conscious, for instance one sinister reminder of a miller's daughter in Grimm, when Tess submits to Joan's pleas and embellishments, saying, Do what you like with me, mother, her surrender to emotional blackmail and commodification by her feckless parents casts her in the role of this classic fairy tale heroine, able to preserve her purity even while submitting to violence and exile. Grimm's Miller, who has traded his daughter to the devil in exchange for immense wealth, asks her, Help me in my need. The daughter responds, Do with me what you will, and the father cuts off her hands. 
Miraculously preserved by a guardian angel, the girl leaves home, marries a king, and bears a child whom she baptises Sorrowful, a name whose universality rings out in the baptism of Tess's dying infant. Unlike the miller's daughter, whose mutilated body is ultimately restored, Tess learns that once lost, always lost, is the rule for chastity. Scattered and reordered, these motifs fracture the conventional pattern of female suffering and redemption. Of another embedded fairy tale, Sleeping Beauty, which was repeatedly rewritten by Victorian adapters such as Christina Rossetti, Dinah Mullet Crack, Anne Thackeray and Jean Ingelow, Hardy was undoubtedly conscious since he parodied its most conspicuous motifs. Having fallen asleep while driving the family cart to market, Tess is awoken not by a prince, but by the death of her horse, Prince, sole support of the Higgler's family. One of her names in the manuscript, Rose Mary, may evoke the Grimm's name for sleeping beauty, Briar Rose, at the moment when she is pricked by the roses that Alec, a pseudo-aristocrat, has offered her, an ill omen that displaces the traditional prick by a needle or spindle that marks the sexual rite of passage of a fairy tale heroine. After beginning work on the D'Urberville estate, the exhausted Tess falls asleep once again, overcome by fatigue and drugged by spirits that he pours unawares down her throat, a detail in the first edition that Hardy would later omit. Sleep is followed inexorably by violence, as the sexual motifs in the tale are brought to the foreground. The power of fairy tale plots to shape people's dreams, and vice versa, is made patent by Joan Derbyfield's hope that Tess would restore the family fortunes by marrying a gentleman. It would have been something like a story to come back with. Even had Alec offered marriage to the farm girl with the manners of a princess, however, Tess might well have responded with a refusal rather than a crude snatching at social salvation. She rejects the trite social solution to her story, just as Hardy in his essay, Candor in English Fiction, rejects the regulation finish that they married and were happy ever after. Her true prince is, of course, Angel, and Tess's willingness to wait indefinitely for Angel conforms to the requirements of the fairy tale. Just as Perrault mocks his heroine for such implausible patience, an ironic attitude echoed by a number of Victorian women writers, Alec here sinisterly assures Tess that she waits in vain, and her struggle to conform to her own ideal ultimately fails. The plot of century-long female virtue rewarded by a happy ending has disintegrated. Legends inevitably erode. So does time ruthlessly destroy his own romances. While Tess's tendency to fall asleep just before a catastrophe has often been noted, the transference of the sleep motif to Angel has been less fully commented on. Angel, whose unconscious submission to social convention and romantic ideals is responsible for his misreading of Tess, believes in the romance of a virginal maid whom he awakens by kissing behind the screen of a willow thicket. Symbolically, Angel wrestles against the reality principle in his sleep, pummeling his travelling trunk as he dreams it to be a crude farmer who has commented that Tess is comely enough but not a maid. Tess awakens him from this sleepwalking episode. On the second occasion, after their mutual confessions of prior sexual experience, Angel wraps Tess in her sheet, then carries her outdoors, across a narrow footbridge, to the overgrown ruin of the nearby Wellbridge Abbey Church, where he places her in the stone coffin of an abbot, kisses her, then falls into the deep, dead slumber of exhaustion. Again, Tess rouses him to protect him from the winter's chill. Angel's difficulty in distinguishing waking from sleeping corresponds to his more general difficulties of self-definition and understanding of the world. A counterpart to women's novels such as Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey or George Sand's Indiana that mock their heroines for reading life through the lens of fiction, Hardy's novel presents Angel as prey to belief in the romantic plot. Angel's return home to Tess is guided by his narcissistic recollection of their wedding day. How her eyes had lingered upon him, how she had hung upon his words as if they were a god's. His delusion that he is a Prince Charming who will awaken Tess sexually is exploded by her confession. Her mishap, he recognises, should be the subject of satire, not of tragic suicide. But his awakening leaves him sleepwalking. Although he is no longer passion's slave, he is not yet enfranchised. The plot he is caught in is not the one he thought he was writing. The anti-romantic thrust of Hardy's narrative experimentation finds a comic representative in the storytelling voice of the farmer who runs the dairy at Talbothays. Dairyman Crick's stories had the peculiarity of seeming to be ended when they were not really so. While churning on a hot summer's day, 
the dairyman tells the comic tale of Jack Dollop, a whore's bird of a fellow who had once worked at the farm. Like the cream, which resists turning into butter, and like Tess herself, who wishes for a perpetual betrothal, Crick's tale of milk a dollop thrives on delays. Doing all the voices with great vivacity, he recounts how the wily dollop hid in the churn from the mother of a young milkmaid he had deceived, apparently eluding her. Crick pauses for comments before then continuing with the mother, who, once she discovered the hiding place, angrily winched the churn. Rattled about inside, Jack finally promised to make it right, and so it ended that day. Derriman Crick hints that his ending may be merely provisional, valid perhaps for but a day, since every narrative is a fragment extracted from the continuum of life. Hardy, we recall, rejected the regulation finish of conventional plots, the denouement which he knew to be indescribably unreal and meretricious but dear to the grundiest and subscriber. Already spun out beyond its first apparent conclusion, the tale of Jack Dollop returns to haunt Tess, for his courting adventures were not really over. Several weeks later, the dairyman reports that Jack did not marry the girl he had wronged, but a rich widow instead, whose income lapsed upon her remarriage. The simple story of the reformed rake receives a twist, turned into a perpetual cat-and-dog domestic conflict, once the deceiver has been deceived. The dairyman's jocular account stands out because of its powerful impact on Tess. Listeners offer a variety of moral comments. Mrs Crick reflects that the widow should have told him sooner that the ghost of her first man would trouble him. Assorted milkmaids suggest, depending on their character, the widow should have told the suitor at the last minute, refused him or knocked him down with a rolling pin. Choking, Tess perceives her own impossible choice before her. What was comedy to them was tragedy to her. In this characteristic moment, Hardy turns a humorous narration inside out, making the sorrow embedded in the tale apparent. While the pregnant girl's tears elicit laughter from the listeners, Tess, reminded of her own experience of violation by a rake, steps outside, overcome by faintness and distress. In 1888, Hardy jotted in his notebook, anticipating what he wrote to Simmons, If you look beneath the surface of any farce, you see a tragedy, and, on the contrary, if you blind yourself to the deeper issues of a tragedy, you see a farce. Commonplace as the observation is, it records a vision of the world that shapes many of the leitmotifs and narrative twists of Tess. Even though she is remote from the nameless widow, Tess enters painfully into her dilemma, this question of a woman telling her story. Angel's dismissiveness, the accident of a rug's placement, and her own passion for him prevent her from telling her own history before their wedding night, but she knows full well that the ghost of the past will trouble her. Later, she senses that an implacable past still engirdles her, and bygones would never be complete bygones till she was a bygone herself. The question of a woman telling her own story, then, lies at the core of Tess's own narrative. The experiences with Alec that Tess confides to her mother on her return are not recorded. Silently, the narrative passes from what was to be on the night in the chase to daybreak several weeks later, when Tess is bearing not only the basket on her arm, but the burden of her pregnancy. Again, when Tess writes out her story in a four-page letter to Angel, the envelope goes astray under a rug, and we do not hear the details that would explain why she was more sinned against than sinning. On her wedding night, the blank page of her story marks the unforgiving gap between the phase of her courtship and the phase entitled The Woman Pays. Her narrative ended, even its reassertions and secondary explanations were done. Tess's unrecorded and unread story, like the tale told by Derriman Crick or the tale of the White Heart, repeatedly seems to be ended when it is not so. After the death and burial of the infant sorrow, Tess sets off to try her hand at milking, and the narrator defiantly declares, Let the truth be told. Women do as a rule live through such humiliations and regain their spirits. Thus begins phase the third, the rally. Probably what shocked readers even more in Hardy's radical recasting of narrative convention was the double violation of their expectations in the final phase, fulfilment. For there, contrary to their desires for a regulation finish, readers wrote asking him to let Tess live, and after her protracted struggle to resist his lust, Tess agreed to become the providence of her little sisters and brothers by returning to Alec as his mistress. Furthermore, if the murder of Alec is a fulfilment of a kind, repaying his admitted wrongs to her, 
Tess's return the same morning to Angel's embrace undoes the priggish image of the cuckolded husband who had rejected her. Perhaps Tess had not forgotten Angel's despair when he learned that Alec was still alive. In any case, the brief happiness she finds on her final pilgrimage from Sandbourne to Stonehenge, from tinselly modernity to a primordial past, baffled readers' belief in the outcomes permitted to a heroine who had committed a fundamentally immoral act. The narrative silence at the major junctures in Tess's life, compounded by Angel's inability to hear her reiterated insistence on telling her history, indicts Victorian censorship of her experiences. The original trauma of her defloration by Alec, enveloped in the vapours of night and drug, remains unassimilable, haunting her as she haunts the Marlet woods at dusk, when the plight of being alive becomes attenuated to its least possible dimensions. For in such a trauma, the mental wound, unlike a physical one, has come too soon, too unexpectedly, to be fully known. The silence itself stubbornly bears witness to the repressed wound that cries out, whose truth buried deep in darkness, sleep and ignorance remains unavailable for mourning and drives Tess forward toward her death. Each of Angel's slighting gestures reenacts her repression. Each attempt to retell her story attempts to voice a history that is socially inaccessible. Gaps also insistently invade the space of their lovemaking, breaking Tess's sentences into fragments and condensing her story into a single name. I, I, am not a Derby field, but a Derbyville. These breaks, like her dry sobs, mark the violence that cannot be told, but will be reenacted through a chain of repetitions that seems overdetermined by ancestry, character, and the casual workings of a rural economy and decay. The trauma repeats itself unremittingly. In our resistance to these silences, we may find one of the secrets to Hardy's apparent ability to conjure a living heroine, even one larger than life. Tongue-in-cheek, Hardy acknowledged in his preface to the fifth edition the contribution to the creative process made by readers' own imaginative intuition. As we undertake our writerly task of reconstituting Tess's figure, we may return to consider her many other forms of expression, the counterpoint of her whistling to the bullfinches, her sublime recitation of the baptismal rites, her weeping empathy with the dying pheasants and her two eloquent letters to Angel. The voice of her letters, heard first as an anguished cry for help, then, in reverse order, as the awakening of Angel's consciousness, takes on life by virtue of its reception. What it tells us is not a sequence of events, but a sequence of feelings, not things done, but impulses and things willed. By her final words, Tess assumes control of events. Her execution will forestall any recriminations by Angel in the future. With the simple phrase, I am ready, she gathers the strands of her life together. Margaret R. Higginett. Thank you for listening. To continue the book, head to the link in the description below. And click here to subscribe to the Penguin YouTube channel for more audiobook samples and videos with your favourite authors. See you next time.